Last week, we kicked off this spiritual growth series talking about growing in faith. And of course, uh, in September, we spent three weeks talking about uh, overcoming evil, overthrowing the spirit of Jezebel, Python, Leviathan. And it's interesting. I've always recognized, listen, when you, when you have a service talking about what the devil does, you can have, you can have a whole, like a full service, like a lot of people, but then all of a sudden when it comes to personal responsibility, it starts to thin out, hallelujah. And I just wanna tell you how proud I am of each and every one of you guys to say, listen, we don't wanna just recognize what the enemy is doing, but also what we're called to do in the midst of it, amen? And one of the things that we identified even in the overcoming series is that everything that the enemy tries to do against you, God is actually wanting to work for you because oftentimes it's in the hardest of seasons that you grow the most, amen? And every attack of the enemy is actually aimed against your growth. It's aimed against God's increase and multiplication in your life. That's why Paul encouraged us, let us not grow weary in well-doing for in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And he's talking about the harvest, the increase of the seed, amen? And grace, of course, is a ministry that happens in the heart, but it flows through every area of our life. But just like we looked at last week with growing in faith, Grace is given to us as a measure or as a seed. Everything in the kingdom begins with a seed and ends in the harvest, amen? And it's between seed time and harvest that personal spiritual growth happens. Let me ask you this. How many of you have been in a growing season, right? You know why? Because challenges equal opportunities to grow. When you don't back away from the challenge, you get to grow, right? Time under tension brings transformation, and so everybody should be transformed by now. Amen. Amen. So Romans 12, 3 told us last week that God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And so when Paul is talking about the measure of faith here, he's not talking about a saving faith or the gift of faith or the word of faith. He's actually talking about the faith that is connected to the ministry function that you're called to walk out. Because grace and faith are not about your comfort, they're about empowering you for your call. Verse six, he says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. And so one of the ways that we grow in our measure of grace and of faith is by beginning to use what we've got, exercising those, those uh, attributes, those giftings, those, those seeds that have been given to us. And then it goes in and talks about some of, these, some of these functions. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. And what we see there is God gives gifts by grace, but we activate them by faith. And how we steward our measure determines how accomplished we will be in our life mission and call. How many of you on that last day, you wanna hear, well done, good and faithful, amen? It is through faithfully stewarding what God has given to us in seed form. You know, back in 2019, I said that the parable of the 2020s would be the parable of the talents. And, and I've just been intimately acquainted with that, you know, even over these last four, almost five years now recognizing that God is all about increase, taking what he has given to us and seeing it increase for his glory and for the good of others. You see in 2 Corinthians 9, it says that God supplies seed to the sower. He multiplies what's sown. So seed doesn't get multiplied until it's given away, right? Your measure of grace and faith doesn't increase until you act on it but then he says he increases the fruit of your righteousness. And so God does the supplying, he does the multiplying, he does the increasing, but between each thing that God does, he's asking us to extend our hand from his heart. And that is where grace goes to work in us. Paul goes on in Romans 12 to say we're in ministry, let us use it, the grace, the gift in our ministering by faith, he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts or encourages in exhortation, he who gives with liberality. How many know there's a, a grace of giving? Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the grace of giving. And grace doesn't mean that it, it's easy. 
That's why Paul could say when he talked about the thorn in his flesh and what he suffered, he said, in my weakness, your grace is sufficient. And so one of the things that we recognize is there are graces that God is wanting to give to us. And they may be some, in some areas that maybe you're not as naturally gifted, or maybe it, it's not something that you just wake up and look forward to doing. Hallelujah. Does anybody just live a, live a life to where everything you get to do in a day is what you wanted to do? Or there are a couple things in between that it's, it's, you know what, this isn't what I wanted to do, but bless God, I get to do it. And see, if we turn our have tos into our get tos, we begin to grow in grace. Amen? And so seed time and harvest, the parable of the talents, is the most important principle to learn and understand and embrace in this season. It's the most important principle to understand, to embrace, and to recognize that, 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 that since Genesis 1.11, God has set up seed time and harvest, that every action produces a reaction, that every choice has a consequence, good, bad, sometimes ugly, but sometimes beautiful, amen? That every time God speaks to us and we act on what God says, it's gonna produce a result of God in the earth. Because when you take God's seed and put it in God's soil, it produces a God harvest. Jesus said in Mark 4, the seed is the word of God. Isn't that awesome? How many are thankful for the word of God? Peter said it like this. We've been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. Amen? That word incorruptible means not subject to decay or destruction. What God has given to you cannot wither as long as you keep planting it. Amen? The greatest seed that's ever been given to us is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And Morgan and Dustin, if you guys have a chance, if we could bring that whiteboard up, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And really there's kind of two two areas of scripture that my heart has been going back and forth between over the past few months. And it's looking at the original mandate that was given in the garden in Genesis 1, and then also looking at what does a present representation of that mandate look like in the earth. Amen? And turn with me, if you could, to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. And I want to take a look at this, and then we're going to step into Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to talk about how to grow your grace in this season. So Genesis chapter 1 Verse 11 says, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. So where's the seed? On the inside. Come on, see, I got seed. Amen. How do we get more seed? He gives seed to the, come on, somebody said, sow it, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He gives seed to the sower. Genesis 1.22, before God ever made man, he started to make the animals and vegetation. And 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 before he ever blessed us to be fruitful and multiply, he blessed the animals to be fruitful and multiply. He blessed the vegetation. He blessed the trees. He blessed the plants. He blessed the apples and the oranges and the pears. He blessed, because God wants fruitfulness in the earth. And what he was looking for in the earth was a representation of heaven. It says in Revelations 22 that there is a tree planted in the middle of the river and that tree produces fruit in every season. And see, fruitfulness, multiplication of God's image in the earth is his mandate that we would continue to see his likeness lived out through our life. Of course, in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, he said, let us make man in our image. And male and female, hallelujah, he made them. And then he blessed them. He blessed them. How many of you are familiar with the principle of first mentions in the Bible? Whenever you see God do something or you see something mentioned the first time, it sets a precedent based on a principle. And the first blessing that God gave was increase. To be fruitful and to multiply. Now, it's not an increase of accumulation. It's not an increase of how much can I get. It's not an increase of what we have. It is an increase of what Pastor Jeff spoke about, that his kingdom would come, his will be done on earth as it is 
and heaven. And heaven. And the blessing we see in Genesis 1.11, the blessing to multiply is on the inside. Come on, say, I've got something on the inside that's ready to go to work on the outside. You have multiplication on the inside. And that's why the enemy has tried to create so much division in the world on the outside. See, because God loves multiplication and increase. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says that God loves a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in their giving. And he said that the way that he responds to those who, are, who joyfully partner with him in the earth, that he is able to make all grace abound to us, to give us all sufficiency in all things, to have an abundance for every good work. That means that when God tells you to do something, or if you see something God is doing, that you don't have to figure out if you can be a part. You just say, man, God's doing it, and I'm going to be a part too because I've embraced the grace that God has given to me. Esther 4.14, 4, he says, if you re- Mordecai tells Esther, if you remain silent, relief, which the word relief there in Hebrew means expansion and increase. So he says, if you remain silent, increase and deliverance will come from someone else. It's interesting that the increase came before the deliverance. And see, a lot of times we think that when the devil gets out of the way, that God is going to show up. I want to tell you, it's God showing up that makes the devil get out of the way. Amen? And then, of course, he goes on to say, who knows if you brought the kingdom for such a time as this? Where are my Esther's at? I know a lot of them, we've, we've got a whole large group in D.C. that were part of that Esther march, of course, and so excited to see all those ladies who gathered together, ladies and men, hallelujah, gathered together to contend for this time and this season that God has entrusted to us. So again, Christ in us, the hope of glory. What grace does is it allows the one that is greater in you to be magnified in your perspective, to be bigger than anything and everything you could face in the world around you. Again, the parable of the talents and seed time and harvest. Jesus said, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a what? A basket. That means that no one has been given something from God and allows the fear of loss to keep them from shining. That word basket is actually where we get the word witchcraft from. The word basket there is wicca. And see, witchcraft or fear or intimidation, or if I do this, something bad may happen, has caused a lot of Christians to live on the defense But as Pastor Jeff shared at our 5785 service, we are moving from the shield to the sword. No longer just trying to quench the fiery darts, but beginning to apply the word of God, the word of grace, the word of truth to every situation in our life. Now, of course, we just entered into the Hebraic year 5785, and before too long, we'll be in 2025, amen? Amen. 2025. And one of the things that I think is very encouraging and interesting is this year on the Hebrew calendar begins and ends with a five. Five, seven, eight, five. Now, we're, we're all my prophetic people. What does five speak of? Grace. grace. Thank you. So grace. So this is a year that is going to both begin and end with grace. One of the things we spoke about at the beginning of the year is that, we were, that our nation was coming into a visitation of grace. And see, sometimes people can hear that and think like, oh man, praise God, because things have been hard. I'm ready for it to get easy. But a visitation of grace is that God's strength will be sufficient where you feel weak where you have felt weary, where you were ready to give up, where you said, God, I can't do this anymore that grace would begin to come upon you. And as you partner with that grace, five, seven speaks of completion or being made perfect. Eight is new beginnings. It would bring you into a new and much greater grace as well. Amen. Paul said that where sin abounds, grace much more. And so anytime I see much more in scripture, I'm like, how much more? Anybody else like that? Jesus said, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more does our heavenly father want to give Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen? And I believe that there's a people that God is looking for. And I believe that you are that people that are a how much more people that are thankful for everything God does, no matter how small or how big. We praise him just the same. But at the same time, we recognize that the more we see, 
the more there is to see as well. I mean, you know, we've seen a lot of great things over the years. Pastor Jeff shared about some of what we've seen even here in the church. And so again, five speaks of grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor, but how many know you can grow in favor? Luke 2.52 said that Jesus increased, there it is again, in wisdom and favor with both God and man. How many know that God wants you to increase? You see, well, that was Jesus. 1 Samuel 2.26 said that Samuel increased. He grew in stature and increased in wisdom and favor. And God is wanting us to increase in wisdom and favor, but the increase of wisdom and favor is in direct proportion to our growing in stature. Us growing up in all things into him who is Christ Jesus. Amen? Grace also means divine empowerment. In fact, when you look at it in the Strong's Concordance, yes, it's favor, and a lot of people, you know, focus on favor, but I want to tell you, grace is God's ability, grace is God's empowerment, and grace is God's favor that is given to us as a gift, but what we do with that gift determines the gift that we get to give back to God for His glory and the gift that we get to give away to others as well. Amen? How many of you are ready to grow in grace? Has anybody had any of those feelings of just going like, God, this is too hard? I has anybody said to yourself like, I don't know if I can do this anymore? Anybody? Just the honest folks, I don't know. <laughs> you can be honest in church. Come on, Pastor Jeff, talk about transparency and vulnerability, amen? I remember uh, Steve Lemmy brought a word uh, several years ago about vats. How many of you know that one of the blessings in Proverbs is that your vat would overflow with new wine and new oil, amen? And he shared it as an acronym, vulnerability, authenticity, and transparency. And there's something about that. David said that he desired truth in the inward part and in the hidden part, he'll make me to know wisdom. And see, when we can be vulnerable with God where we're at, God, listen, I don't know if I can do this anymore. He's like, oh man, you're weak, don't worry. I've got grace to make you strong. You, you mean that you can't do what I've called you to do without me, that's great because I'm with you. I'm for you. And together we can do anything. Amen? Ephesians chapter four, verse seven says this. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter four if you could. Ephesians four, verse seven says, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. There's that measure again. So Paul said in Romans, we've been given a what? A measure of faith. Here in Ephesians 4, it says to each one of us. That means every one of us have been given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The word gift there is the word charis, where we get charisma. It means a supernatural endowment for blessing and deliverance of others. And what, what we see there is when God ascends, when Jesus ascends on high in verse eight, it said when he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. And how did Jesus give gifts to men? <laughs> Through you. You are a gift. You see the word there for grace literally means this. A, it's a gift offered in expression of honor or sacrifice. But then it goes on. This is another definition of the Greek word for grace. Money cast into the treasury for the purpose of the temple and for the support of the poor. Isn't that cool? So when God gives grace, he is giving an investment into our treasury, in, into the inner man of who we are and who we are born to be for the building of his temple. And I'm not talking about a building made with hands. I mean, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so grace is the deposit that God makes in you that causes you to be built up in all things to look just like him in the earth. And it goes on to say, to provide support for the poor or to give truth to those who have had a lie, to give goodness where there has been evil, to overcome that which is evil with good, to recognize where there is lack in the world and to say, bless God, I've got grace for abundance in this area. 
One of the things that came up in pre-service prayer this morning, Pastor Tina was, was just praying about uh, chaos and distraction. And in Genesis 1.1, it said when the world was without form and void, that that's when God spoke and said what? Let there be light and the Holy Spirit went to work. Without form and void actually means full of chaos. And see, chaos is always the evidence of the lack of God in a situation. Because how many of you know if God is in a situation, you have divine order. You may not know how, you may not know how everything's going to work out, but you're confident it is going to work out right? You have Christ in you even when you're in a crisis. And it's given to us in seed form. First Peter chapter 4 verse 10 says, as each one has received a gift, everyone has been given a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And see, you are a gift from God to others but we got to open up what's on the inside to begin to give it away to those who are on the outside. Paul goes on in Ephesians 4, verse 8. Therefore, he said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Verse 11 said, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. This is, of course, talking about the office of the fivefold. Here we are again. Fivefold. But how many recognize that you may not be in a full time vocational position connected to a fivefold office, but every one of you has a fivefold grace? As, a, as an apostolic person, you're able to bring divine order where there's chaos. You're able to, to see what others are saying prophetically, and what they say, you're able to see what it's meant to look like. Those who have a pastoral call, you're mercy motivated. You see someone who's suffering and you're gonna get down in the ditch with him. You're the good Samaritan who comes alongside of them and says, I don't know how you got to where you are, but I'm gonna help you get out of the ditch, amen? The teachers, to where all of a sudden you don't wanna just know, what, you, you don't wanna just know what something is, but you wanna understand why is it? And then the evangelist, that you can't just, you just can't help but tell everybody about how good God is, Amen. And one of the things that I think that has happened for a lot of people is we've put the gifts we've been given by grace on the shelf and we've looked for someone else to do what we're called to do. But the thing about grace is it empowers you to do what nobody else can do like you. Somebody else can do what you do, but nobody can do it like you do it. And see, you are an incredible piece and part of the plan of God in this season. God's not surprised by anything that's happened in your life. And he's already put everything in you to bring his abundant life in those areas. So he goes on to talk about how the fivefold, which again are these ministries of grace, for the equipping of the saints, for the empowerment, the, the enabling of the saints, for the, for, uh, for the ministry, and for the edifying. That word edifying means the building up of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so grace is all about becoming just like Jesus. And not just you becoming like Jesus, but everybody that comes in contact with you becoming more like Jesus because of the Christ in you. In fact, grace is given. God gives us grace to make us just like Jesus. In John 1, it said that when Jesus came, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten son. And it said in verse 12, full of grace and full of truth. And what grace does, it's the divine enablement it's the empowerment, it's the favor of God that enables, that causes you to live out the truth with his spirit and not your power. Amen? Zechariah chapter four, verse six. Zerubbabel uh, is, is, is in a tough time, hallelujah. He's hit a wall in what he was called to. And he has this vision where an, an angel shows up and shows him a lampstand. And, and he's like, what do you see? And he's like, I see a lampstand. He said, you seem well, not by your might, not by your power, but by the spirit of the Lord. And see what grace causes us to do is to recognize that what we cannot do in the natural, we can always do in the spirit. 
And regardless of what's happening in the natural around us, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And then Zerubbabel begins to speak to the opposition in his life, the resistance, the challenges. And he, he, he begins to look at what was a mountain. And he shouts at the mountain, grace, grace. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you'll become a plain. Now, before he had the word about the spirit, he was overcome by the mountain. But once he recognized that God could do by his spirit what the rubble could not do in the natural, he started shouting at the mountains and recognizing the opportunity that was before him. It goes on in verse 14, says, we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth and love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. So grace is God's empowerment that causes us to grow. Grace is the health of God on the inside that causes us to grow in every area of our life so that his kingdom can increase in and through the life that we live. Verse 16, from whom the whole body being joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And see, the thing about grace is you don't grow in grace in times of isolation. You actually grow in grace by walking out your call connected with other people. That's where iron sharpens iron. Maybe some of you have said, I don't know if I can do this anymore in regards to a relationship. Hallelujah. Or, or, or a challenge where maybe you felt misunderstood or maybe not honored or respected or appreciated like you thought. But it's in that place you recognize, wait a minute, this person is not working against me, but what is working on them is working for me. If I can respond rightly and win them to the truth of God for their life. Amen. So again, grace is all about empowering us. And the key to growing in this season is discerning distractions and making the consistent commitment to keep our eye single. How many of you recognize an increase of distraction? Mike Briscoe was sharing with us in pre-service prayer. He, he just got back from hiking the Appalachian Trail. And he said, man, it was so great just to put my phone away. He's like, I didn't realize how long it had been since I, I just had time to think and to be quiet and to begin to hear. And see, there are a lot of things that are meant to serve us that if we don't recognize their role and our rule, they can begin to rule over us. How many know what I'm talking about? God told us several years ago, if you'll give me your gates, I'll give you my glory. And see, there's so much hopelessness in the earth but the God of hope is living on the inside of us in seed form. He's just looking to be sown. Paul said in Romans chapter eight, that all of creation is eagerly waiting for the revealing of you, the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God, that, that creation would be delivered from the bondage of corruption and brought into the liberty that we have been given by the father. But again, just like in Genesis one, the seed is in you. The freedom for the world around you is the truth that's on the inside. All of creation is groaning for Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you got Christ plus you, okay? But what God is asking us to do is to go from a place of addition to multiplying the Christ in us with radical hope. How many of you, your hope is pretty strong right now? That's awesome. Has anybody's hope just been like, mm? you can always tell where your hope is, or you can always tell where your hope, you can, always, you can always identify what you've been looking at and listening to by recognizing where your hope is, right? If you got the spirit of chicken little and the sky is falling, you probably haven't been listening to the word, amen? You've probably been listening to the news, not the good news, amen? I've been there. But what God is inviting us to do 
is to recognize the power of multiplication in this season. That Christ is the seed, you are the soil, but hope is the miracle grow when it comes to grace. Hope. Faith is the substance, the title deed, the evidence of things not seen. Romans 15, 13 says, the God of hope would fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you would abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you recognize that in Matthew 24, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming, the second coming of the Son of Man. And I did a podcast last week talking about uh, your, your window, your window of deliverance in this season. And what's interesting, when you even look at the Hebrew year, when you look at the number five, it's the letter H, and there's a window in the upper left-hand corner. And I started to look at the, 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 the journey of Noah and started really, you know, ever since October 22nd of last year, I've really been looking at Genesis and as in the days of Noah, because how I many you know we don't know the hour, but we can recognize the season. And how I many you know, Noah didn't know what day it was gonna rain, but he knew that he was building for what was coming. And a lot of times we can look at what we're building on the, on the outside, what you're building on the inside is of so much more importance than what is being built on the outside. And what a lot of people have walked through in this season has actually made you into the man and the woman of God that your future is gonna require you to be. What's interesting in Genesis 6, when, when Noah is building an ark in Genesis 6, it says that Noah found what? Grace. We're growing in grace this week, Sarah. That was last week. <laughs> I love me some Sarah P. Let's thank the Lord for Sarah P. Hallelujah. Come on. Listen, we, I was with her yesterday. Some Frank Sinatra came on. She started. She said, she did my jam. Hallelujah. Noah found grace. So before he was ever told to build an ark, God gave him the ability and the favor that would enable him to do what he could not do apart from God. How many of you know, I bet that there are some people probably talking about Noah. Like Noah has lost his mind. He's building a boat. What's a boat? Had rain for 400 years. Two things that, that God told Noah to build in it. He said, put a door in the side and a window up top. And what you see is God, when, when, when he told Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives to take all of the animals, two by two, male and female, into the ark, God shut the door. It said that God shut them in. In Genesis chapter seven, verse 16, he shut them in. Has anybody had some doors shut the last year? And see, he said, listen, I want you to build a door and I'm gonna close some doors to protect you for what I have for you in the future. Because I know if that door hadn't been shut, they would have been underwater. And what's interesting is when you look in Genesis Verse, uh, chapter eight, verses five and six, it said it was in the 10th month. Now I know they were on the Hebrew calendar, but I draw encouragement everywhere. That's how I stay full of hope. Right. What is October? 10th month. 10th month. In the 10th month, the rain and the flood ceased. And God said, open up the window. And when he opened up the window, he released the dove from himself. I mean, that's a picture of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of grace. And grace was looking for a place where it could begin to rest in the earth again. It was looking for the waters of a time of destruction had come to an end. And all of a sudden the waters were beginning to come down so that man could begin to step out again. And in Genesis chapter eight, verse 20, when the, when the dove was released the third time and did not come back, it said that Noah gave an offering. And this is what God said. While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. Chapter nine, verse one. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. He was saying, the grace that I gave you, that I have preserved through your obedience, because he grew in grace with every, every action of obedience. Going around looking for that gopher wood. Where do you get gopher wood? Do they have that at Home Depot? I ain't seen no gopher wood. But how many know 
There was a lot of areas in the building of the ark that Noah probably could have cut some corners. Well, God probably didn't mean what he said. Does it really have to be that many cubits? Does it really have to be that big and that tall? How many know God knows exactly what he wants to build in the earth for what's coming? And I want to tell you, under the old covenant, he had to build something on the external. And the new, he's building in the internal. And everything that you're, every moment of every day is building an ark of his presence in you. That the windows could be opened up to be able to full, freely receive and fully give what God has given to you. And the only thing that can keep you from recognizing your new window is trying to hold on to an old door. Trying to open up something that God needed to close for you, not to withhold from you, but to protect you and to provide for you and to prepare you to be fruitful, to multiply and to fill the earth. Grace is a ministry of the heart that is designed to flow freely from every area of our life as we continue to give to others from the grace of God that we have been so freely given. Grace is not found in doing what you are comfortable with, but in doing what you are called to. This is why Paul, the apostle of grace said, I labored for you until Christ was fully formed in you. How many of you in 2020 have felt look more like Jesus than in 2020. Yes. Every hand raised. Because yeah. listen, I'm on the outside looking in and I can tell you, I see so much more of him. I see so much more of him in you. I see so much more of Jesus being formed in you in the times of pressing, in the times of continuing to do the next right thing, trusting God with, <clears throat> with the results. As you've strengthened yourself in the Lord, as you've recognized things that maybe you would do differently have given the opportunity again. And that's wisdom because a lot of those things, we're gonna be given an opportunity to do it again. Say, do it again. Many people in life are looking for a miracle from the outside. And how many know a miracle speaks of multiplication? They're looking for a miracle from the outside. A miracle from the outside. Second Kings chapter four, you see a, a, a widow comes to Elisha and her, she's actually the wife of Obadiah. And she said, my husband, your servant is dead. He's like, okay. She's like, and I got a debt we can't pay and they're coming to take the kids. Y'all remember this story? Everybody awake? Okay. She said, they're coming to take my kids. He said, what do you want me to do? What do, you, what do you have? What do you have in your house? She said, I got nothing but a jar of oil. How many of you recognize she was looking for a miracle from the outside? But the miracle, the seed of the miracle was on the inside. Because again, five speaks of grace. And what she had with that jar, she had, some, she had a, a, a grace gift. She had some oil. She had a picture of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But when she said, I got nothing, how many of you know grace times zero equals zero? What did Elisha tell her to do? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take what you've got, a little jar of oil. And instead of looking at what you don't have, I want you to go find some empty people. Find some empty places. Go to your neighbors and begin to gather vessels, vats. Begin to gather those that you can begin to pour into. And how many of you know, if she began to start taking the grace that had been given to her, and if she went to two neighbors, what does that equal? Oh my gosh, we are growing. She takes the same grace and goes to three neighbors. Where's my mathematician, Sarah? 15, thank you. Come on now, where are we at? Do you see how just knocking on four doors took what looked like not enough to becoming more than enough? And here's the interesting thing is, it said that the oil did not run out until she ran out of places to give, until she ran out of people to pour into. 
And see, for us to grow in grace, we have to recognize that we have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness, but until we give it away, it really doesn't produce anything. But then all of a sudden you go to one person and hallelujah, you go to two people, you go to three people, you go to four people. Richard, how many people do you come in contact with during a given week? 40? I thought that'd be a day, hallelujah. That'd be phone calls too, hallelujah. So slowing down. So 40 people. So how many of you know Richard Mixon's got some grace? Come on, if you don't know, I'll get him up here and show you his legs, hallelujah. My boy's got some grace. So he, Richard's got some grace. Richard goes to 40 people. What does that equal? Come on, we got some mathematicians. How many of you know he began to increase because God supplied him a seed of grace that he began to give away, God multiplied it, and then all of a sudden now 200, I want to say little Richards, <laughs> but <laughs> good old little Richard, he, he was something, wasn't he? 200 little, little Jesuses with big Holy Spirit through the ministry of big Richard, hallelujah. And here's the thing is, every person you come in contact with every week they are wanting your seed to be sown in their soil because they want him in you to begin to live in them. The woman, the woman with, the, with the, the, the debt, she said, I don't have anything but this little thing. And she was looking for a miracle everywhere but what she had. And then when she took what she had and just did something that didn't make sense and began to pour it out, it said that the oil did not run out until there was no vessels left to pour into. How many people we got in the country? Was it 330 million, something like that? I know, I mean, we're not counting the dead people on the voting rolls. The uh, <laughs> 8 billion in the world? I don't even know. I'm sure somebody over here can figure out. Five times 8 billion? But that sounds like the whole earth being filled with the knowledge of God's glory because a couple people as stewards of grace begin to freely give away what they've got, not looking for an answer from the outside to meet the place that is without form and void in them, but recognizing that we're not an empty people, but we have been filled with the fullness of God. And if we begin to start by grace, beginning to give away to others what we've got, just like Paul said in Ephesians 4, just like Noah did by simply doing stuff that other people didn't understand, but he knew he was being obedient. We can prepare the world for his coming to make ready the bride for his return. I've got some good news for you. The area you've been afflicted the most, God wants to increase you the most. How many of you have been afflicted? Let me ask you this. How many of you have an area in your life that you, that you have some fear? See, oftentimes the area of your greatest fear is actually the area of your greatest gift. Because fear is a basket that's coming over your God-given light. And what happens is, is when we recognize, man, I've, I've got a fear here in my present because I've been afflicted in my past it can cause us to put our light under a basket instead of shining bright for the world to see. How many of you, if I was to ask you what your greatest fear is, you'd be able to identify it right off the bat? Shout out the first three. What, what, what's your greatest fear? What is it? End time torture. Smoke them if you got them. I say bring it on. Hallelujah. All right. I, but Jeannie, I certainly hear you. Who else? Greatest fear? Yes. Abandonment, rejection, right? Greatest fear. Speaking of, girl, come here. <laughs> Here's what I want to tell you. Number one, Jeannie, you know why you have that fear? It's because you have a love that endures. There's not a quit in you. And here's the thing is, whether you were born to be a martyr or a Mary, he gets the same reward through your faithfulness. Alicia, listen, I love hearing you speak. And here's the thing is, when you have that fear of speaking in front of people, does that cause you to overthink what you're about to say before you say it? Yeah, Jesus said, hey, listen, when you have opportunity to testify, don't give any thought, just let your belly speak, amen? 
in terms of abandonment and rejection. You know what that tells me is that not only are you so loved by him, but you're actually so loved, celebrated and accepted by everyone around you that you're like, when you walk into the room, you brighten it up. But the fear of what you could experience in walking in a room has kept you out of the rooms you're called to brighten. But the grace in you causes that room to come alive. And so in the area that you've experienced the greatest fear, God has given you the greatest gift. Anybody had any financial fear? You know why? Because God has gifted you and graced you to be a steward of kingdom resources. Fear of losing your life. I know Jeannie shared that. You know why? Because you have a gift to lay down your life for others by loving them well. And so what you do is you take the fear, the false evidence that has appeared real, that has kept you from growing and giving that grace away. Because even if you have a fear of being tortured, you're probably going to think a little bit more about what you say on Facebook. Hallelujah. You can see I don't have that fear. <laughs> and so, and uh, mm, hallelujah. You know, we all have our, di- and that's why we're, a, we're one body. We all have different members, right? But you recognize is that's your greatest place of anointing. And so the place that God wants you to grow in grace the most is the place that you've been the most afraid the place where fear has showed up and tried to knock on your door, that's the place where grace is wanting to form and frame a brand new threshold for you to walk into that new season of anointing that Miranda spoke of. Affliction. It said that when the Israelites were under uh, Pharaoh, it said the more they were afflicted, the more babies they had. Somebody got that, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, the more they were afflicted, the more they increased. And see, Pharaoh said, they're going to become more mighty than us. And so that was when they wanted to try to kill all the firstborn. Why? Because the way that the grace of God, the economy of God works, even under the old covenant, the way that God's plan works is what the enemy tries to work against you, God always uses to bring his increase through you. He always uses to bring his increase through you. What about Joseph? Joseph. How many know Joseph was given a coat of many colors? Why? He had favor. He had favor. Who who took Joseph's first coat? His family. His family was the first to strip him of his favor, right? Gets thrown in the pit, ends up being sold into slavery, serves in Potiphar's house. He has a second coat. Who took that coat? Potiphar's wife. So first family stripped him and then false accusation tried to strip him and both of them took his coat, but they could not take his call because he went from Potiphar's house into prison and where everybody else would have thought, man, God has left me. He kept his gift on. He kept interpreting dreams. He kept walking in the gift that was given by grace and, and, and was able to give understanding to others at their times. But how many of you know Joseph was given a third coat? Because when he gets brought out of the prison, it said that Pharaoh gave him his coat and his ring and made everyone in the nation bow before Joseph and to honor. And here's, and again, it's not honoring a person. It's recognizing the grace that's on them. And one of the ways that we grow in grace is regardless of what happens to us, we don't turn off the light that's on the inside. One of the ways that we grow in grace is also recognizing that when when there's grace on somebody else, Jesus said how you receive someone determines what you receive from someone. You receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. You receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. How you receive people. This goes back to Jacob's uh, uh, video about familiarity. How we receive others actually helps us to receive from the grace that's on them And when their grace comes in contact with our gift, together we all grow. How many of you see that? And so again, the place of your greatest affliction, God is wanting to bring increase. The place of your greatest fear is where God is wanting to bring your greatest growth. And here's the great thing, and this is something that I've been challenged by even with the Lord. After Joseph goes through everything he went through, and how many of you know, He had a dream, but the dream was never the problem. It was the favor. 
And see, favor, when not recognized, can cause you to feel abandoned or rejected. And you're favored of the Lord. Because I mean, you know, the nature of humanity is to become jealous of what we don't have. Right? His family was jealous, and then Potiphar's wife, you know, they were both, you know, Potiphar's wife and the family, they all, they all wanted what he had, hallelujah. Different measures. But after he came out of it, he had two sons. He named them Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh means... I have forgotten the pain of my past. And Ephraim means that God has made me twice as fruitful in my affliction. And one of the ways to grow in the grace of God is to not allow the pain of your past to keep you from being fruitful when you experience affliction. That when you do experience fear, you don't go into a worst case scenario, but that's when you begin to say, bless God, I've been given a measure of faith I've been given a measure of grace, and with God, I'm more than enough to accomplish what I'm called to and to run this race. When you need increase in your life, how many of you need increase? Okay, an increase can take on many different forms. Sometimes it's financial increase, sometimes it's emotional increase, relational increase. Reconciliation, healing. How do you know what you do for others, God will always do for you? I've seen more miracles happen when someone who needed a miracle prayed for somebody else to get a miracle. How many of you know it's, it really is better to give than to receive? Like even, I've heard even testimonies, you know, and I so think, you know, Haley does an incredible, let's, get, let's thank the Lord for Haley, Hallelujah. <laughs> She comes back every week showing me testimonies of, of just what's happening in the, in the cafe or what's happening on the golf carts or what's happening in different areas of ministry here. And here's the thing is, all of the testimonies are connected to somebody who was given grace that started to find two, three, four, 40 people to pour into. And all of the testimonies were like, you know what? I came and I didn't feel like coming. I was discouraged because of some things that were happening. But when I just came and I just started trying to encourage others, man, all of a sudden the basket came off my light and I began to shine. And I want to tell you, it's easy to shine in here. But you know where you shine brighter? Out there. So if you need encouragement, you give encouragement. If you need healing, you pray for others to be healed. If you need love, if you, if you feel... And again, I'm, I hate to use the word that you need love, but if you're in a situation where you don't feeling as loved and accepted, you know how you break that lie? Because it's not that you're trying to get something you don't have. You begin to intentionally love others. You begin to look for opportunities to do for somebody else what you know God wants to do for you. And then watch how it's no longer about trying to get miracles from others, but as you release miracles to others, you become the miracle in the making. So again, when you need increase, you sow a seed. Because seed will always produce harvest. But the challenge with a seed is you got to get them out of themselves. Genesis 1.11, the seed is in itself. And I believe that what God is challenging Kingsway with in this season is to return to a spirit of expectancy. To return to an awareness of Christ in you that we're not looking for someone from the outside to do something for us, whether it's at work, whether it's in government, whether it's in a relationship, but we recognize I've been given everything. I've been given everything that I need. And it may be in seed form, but if I'm faithful with what looks like little, I know it'll become much, just like that widow with the oil, because I found grace in his sight and he's building something in me every day as I grow in his grace. Pastor Jeff, can you and the worship team come on up? And here's what I want to encourage you with. We're going to go ahead and receive our offering. And then the Lord had me write some declarations for today specifically connected to this word. And again, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, of course, that God loves a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in what? They're giving. And I don't want you to see that verse as just about giving monetarily to God. Jesus talked more about money than heaven and hell combined. Why? Because money had a hold on so many people's hearts. 
And, the tr- and I have found in my life the true pathway to financial freedom is not allowing, allowing fear to have a voice in my life. But I believe that there's an even greater uh, understanding and interpretation of what Paul was speaking to. That God loves a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in their giving. And when we recognize that we've been given favor, that we are greatly favored by God, that we have been divinely empowered, divinely gifted, uniquely formed and fashioned for such a time as this. And we may just be one seed, but when we begin to give away what we've got, God will do the multiplication and he'll begin to bring the increase. I want to tell you, God takes pleasure in. It says in 2 Corinthians 9, the Amplified, he takes pleasure in above everything else and refuses to do without people who freely give away to others what God has given to them. And the more we give away what God has given to us, encouragement, prophetic words, prayers of healing, a smile, holding a door for somebody. How about just returning, uh, uh, returning blessing for curses? Instead of saying, oh, I'm going to, you know, you did that. I'm going to one-up you. Where are my one-uppers at? Hallelujah. I, I, I've had a spirit of one-up on, you know, at times. Hit me, I'll hit you harder. But how many of you know, listen, that works against who you were born to be. And it's in those moments, grace speaks and says, that's, that's the pain of your past. That's the affliction. That's where you were, but it's not who you are. And God is inviting all of us to take a step of grace today, to step into his enablement, to step into that place of favor. And to, like Pastor Jeff said, not live with a shield trying to protect ourselves, but say, you know what? We've been bought with a great price and we want our life to be spent freely for him. I want my life to matter. I want your life to matter. That every one of us here, well done, good and faithful. That when you get to heaven, they don't just say, you know what, we had more planned for your life, but 80% is okay. I want you to get to heaven and say, you know what, boy, we, you did a whole lot more than we ever expected. <laughs> and I want to tell you, listen, when God sees you, man, he sees the answer to every problem. He sees solutions. He sees healing for the hurting. He sees hope. And as you begin to give away that grace, not only are you going to grow, but you're going to recognize the things you've been the most afraid of, you're going to begin to run at. You're going to have a boldness and a courage. Alicia will be run up, taking the microphone. You'll be, you'll be running into rooms that you weren't even invited in. Just saying, hey, here I am. The party can get started. Go ahead and stand to your feet. And I just want to pray. I want to pray for the Christ in you. See, because it's by faith through grace that we've been saved. We've been given Christ, the anointed one in his anointing. He took the very best seed and put it in what he thought was the best soil. But it's hope that causes that seed in us to increase, to grow, and to be multiplied as we give it away. Father, even today, as we honor you with our finances, Lord, as we like that woman with the oil, God, as we take what we've been given and we just simply give it away, God, I pray that the spirit of, Lord, I invite just a fresh spirit of generosity, Lord, not just in the area of our finances, but in every area of our life, God. Lord, that we would be the most generous people on the planet. What you want, baby, we got it. That as we have freely received from you all things that pertain to life and godliness, that we would begin to radically, generously, and freely without reservation, give away to others what you have given to us. Lord, I bless right now the Christ in every person right now. I thank you for the anointing, the unique anointing in them. And I ask for a spirit of hope right now. In fact, I just want you to come up to the front. Just We can come on down and give our offers. I want to pray for an impartation of hope. And we're going to do, declare these offering declarations together. But I do, I feel there's a tangible spirit of hope that God wants to release in this house. And if you're here and you say, listen, I, I need that hope. 
I want you just to, to lift your hands when you come up and just begin to receive. Because I, I do, I feel hope, like a mantle of hope. I feel like ministries of hope being born. Lord, we thank you. God, I thank you for a people of hope. Zechariah 9 says, return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. And even today, I declare that I will restore double. Right now, Father, I thank you for the hope that has been in seed form. But right now, I speak great growth and radical increase to hope right now in the name of Jesus. And even where, even when some of what we've hoped for has felt like a prison at time, God, I thank you for a restoration of double for that which we have hoped because hope does not disappoint. Romans 5, he says, by faith, we stand in this place and in this place we experience tribulation, but it produces perseverance and character and hope and hope that does not disappoint. Hope cannot let you down because it's in that place. He said in Romans 5.5 5, that God pours out, the Holy Spirit pours out the love of God in your hearts. Lord, let the spirit of increase come on hope right now. Lord, even as we give seeds of hope, God, let a harvest of hope come to this body, come to our nation. God, I thank you, Lord, that in the area of our greatest affliction, that you would cause us to increase. In the area of our greatest fear, that you would cause us to rise up with a greater boldness, a greater tenacity, a greater resolve because of the one that we do everything for. I thank you that in the same way Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, that each and every person would not only recognize the grace they have found, but they begin to start finding new ways to grow in that grace as well. In Jesus, whoa, hey, 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 hey. Mm, man, I just felt like this defibrillator of hope right now. Lord, I thank you, clear, bam, clear, bam, clear, bam, right now. Lord, I, I call hearts online right now. I call hearts online. It's, it said in Romans 5.5, 5, it's the Holy Spirit who pours out the love of God in your hearts. I speak right now for that defibrillator right now to bring your heart back into the rhythm of his revelation for your life. Aaron, can you put those declarations on the screen for us? And let's all with one voice declare it together. Say, as we give today's offering, we are believing the Lord for increase and multiplication wisdom and revelation, great grace and extravagant favor, both in our life and in our labor. We thank you for open heavens and the provision and promotion you're releasing to us for such a time as this. We give you praise today that every thief is caught, every need is met, and every debt is canceled. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let that be your hope as we worship. Hey. Who is moving on the waters? Who is holding up the moon? Who is peeling back the darkness? With the burning light Standing on the mountains Who is on the earth below Who is bigger than the heavens And the lover of my soul Creator God be a Yahweh The great I am the Lord of all the Yahweh. Those who share the Yahweh, the righteous son of the Yahweh, the three in one Yahweh. Who is he that makes me happy? Who is he that gives me peace?
you to get your hopes up to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift Christ in you we have been given the gift of grace and when partner with hope that's when we see the whole world filled with the glory of God Father right now I thank you Lord for Christ in us and the multiplication factor of hope today. God, I thank you, Lord, that everywhere we go this week, Lord, there would be testimonies of your goodness, experiences with your glory, that the Christ in us would be revealed to the world around us. We say, let your kingdom increase. Let your will be done in Birmingham, in Irondale, in Helena, across Alabama, Trustville, America, and the world, God. Lord, let your body take full grasp of the grace that you have made available to us in this season of grace. That we would see your spirit of grace and your spirit of glory rest on people and places again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have an incredible week. We'll see you Wednesday night. Christ in us, part two.
We love you. <laughs>